Welcome to this Friends at Home event sponsored by the Alameda Free Library, Friends of the Alameda Free Library. Tonight, we will be talking with author Debbie Chen about her book, Dancing in Their Light, A Daughter's Unfinished Memoir. I am T.C. Curry from Friends of the Alameda Library, a nonprofit organization raising funds and advocating for our outstanding public library in the beautiful city of Alameda, California. These events are free, but you will not be surprised to learn that we appreciate donations. A little later, you'll see a link for the donations in the chat thread. We appreciate any donations, large or small, to support these virtual events, as well as many of the real life programs conducted in the library. Before we get started, you should know this is a live webinar and we will be recording it and it will be posted on YouTube. So your microphone and camera are turned off. Please use the chat to introduce yourself let us know where you're calling in from and to ask questions. We will try to get to all of your questions at the end of the program. We do ask to make sure that you are using the chat respectfully. If you use it disrespectfully, you will be cut off. So enough mechanics, let's move on. We are joined tonight by Debbie Chin, who has had a remarkable career in the lively arts but her family's history as immigrants from China is just as remarkable. Debbie is currently the executive director of Theater Works Silicon Valley. Um, she's a former managing director of the California Shakespeare Theater in Arinda and has a long career with many other significant posts in arts administration. Dancing in Their Light, published in 2022, chronicles her family's missionary connections and escape from China and how her chemist father ended up creating the House of Mahjong on Long Island, where she entered the workforce at the age of three selling cigarettes. Uh, her responsibilities grew as she aged and she became an exotic hula and sword dancer, performing weekly at nights after a full day of middle and then high school giving her a lifelong love of performing. So welcome, Debbie, to our program, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's good to be back in the East Bay, where I used to live, so nice to be back home. Always nice to talk to a local author. <laughs> You're currently in um, uh, Silicon Valley, right? So That's just right. across the bay. I'm across the bay. Awesome. So I would love to start with a reading from your book. Can you set the scene for us? Absolutely. I thought I'd read a little bit of the introduction about how this book came to be. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, just a very brief excerpt. So this is uh, how I started uh, Dancing in Their Light. Growing up in a restaurant and nightclub selling cigarettes at the age of three, working as a bartender's helper at the age of six, and spending my weekends performing as a hula dancer during my teenage years are naturally good fodder for a memoir. There aren't many people whose childhood included learning how to walk on fire and dancing with sharp knives. I was reminded of all of this when I discovered my father's eight page memoir about the history of our family business, the House of Mahjong, which rose to great acclaim during its lifespan in Syosset, Long Island, New York. And so I was putting stuff on Facebook and I got so many requests of people to post more memories. and. Uh, and they remembered the food that they ate. They remembered the toys they bought at our, my mother's gift shop. Mm -hmm. They remembered the names of the waiters. And so I set forth to write a book about Mahjong's distinct personality of a gilded age of dining out when dining out as a family was a weekly tradition, when restaurants had private phone booths and coat check rooms, and when men wore hats, women wore gloves and children had manners as well as a golden age of Polynesia and the Polynesian floor shows that were so ubiquitous in the 1960s and 70s. And I wondered how did a simple Chinese restaurant like ours become so ingrained in people's memories all throughout these years? And what was it about the restaurant that provided decades of customer loyalties and what was unique about our family's business that might be missing in today's workplace? And so a book about our family is incomplete with about the story about my parents and our elders whose lives were chiseled by tragedy and effects of war, starvation, poverty, mystery, luck, and divine opportunities. 
And so I embarked on an oral history with my Aunt Daisy, my mother's younger sister who lived in Irvine, California. And I, uh, she was a teacher and she uh, taught me all about our family history, things that I never knew. Uh, and I learned that uh, our family history can be traced back to the missionaries of China. Uh, but then, but then, a resurgence of anti-immigration vitriol surfaced in 2017, when the national discourse accelerated towards the building of walls and deportation of families and immigrants. And uh, we were referred to uh, by as having started the, the Kung flu virus and the mm -hmm. Chinese virus. And so I watched reports of Asians, particularly the elderly, beaten, targeted and killed on the streets of America. And I began to believe that we were on the precipice of another dangerous chapter in US history and the possible return of the Chinese Exclusion Act or any congressional act designed to ban immigrants, especially those of color from coming to the United States. And parenthetically, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 is the only congressional act that mentions the exclusion of a race by name. It's the Chinese Exclusion Act. There isn't a, an Irish Exclusion Act or a German Exclusion Act. There's only the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so I wanted to talk about my family's sizable role in building humanitarian efforts. When my mother and her siblings came to the United States as young teenagers, young women and a young man, they, uh, th there was a bicordial relationship between China and the United States at that time, hard to believe now. And so I wanted to tell the stories of my family elders and what they did to advance the fields of nursing, medicine, aerospace, technology, culinary hospitality, chemistry, teaching, all the things um, that uh, advanced this country in those days. And so that is a bit of the introduction that I write about and the book encapsulates the immigrants. And then what I think might be the fun part is uh, the Polynesian nightclub and the hula dancing piece of it. But TC, that's kind of a, a setup to what the book is all about. Thank you. Um can you, I mean, you told us a little bit about why you chose to delve into this topic now. Um, and I'm wondering how long did it actually take to write the book? Because you say in the introduction that you went on Facebook and then posted something, just some pictures that you had found, and there was this huge outpouring of love. And so you thought, oh, I should like do this at some point. So um, how long did it actually take to write the book? So for all of the aspiring authors and established authors in the group, you know, it takes a long time. It took me 10 years um, okay. from the oral history part, which was originally meant to be a gift that I could give to my younger cousins as mm -hmm. something to memorialize our family history. Uh, but then uh, there, when I posted on Facebook and teased out little snippets of what it was like to, uh, to to be a hula dancer, what it was like to have spare ribs. And, you know, all these memories started coming back. And somebody said to me, you've got to write a book. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, okay, I know nothing about it, but why not? <laughs> so, uh, and I did this during the COVID time. I began mm -hmm. to really power up and get this finished uh, when I saw the, in, the, the rise of anti- Asian hate in the country. And that was my catalyst to get the book finished and published. Mm. Can you, um, wow. Can you talk about some of the obstacles that you ran into, if there were any, like, you know, you sat down, your mother had passed at this point. And so you sat down with your aunt and went through oral histories. And was she the one who um, got you the really old family photographs so i when my mother and father died i'm i'm a i'm i was i'm so sentimental i'm a real softy at heart and i saved everything and i'm glad i did because in the book i mentioned that my mother's uh, siblings and my mother escaped numerous atrocities in china the my mother was impacted by the japanese occupation of china in 1937 mm -hmm. it's an eight-year war and my mother and her family were told to burn and purge anything that would um, tie them into um, uh, their, their, their heritage. So very, very few articles made it out. And the ones that did, I treasure these photos that 
um, what came into through a steamer trunk and mm-hmm. were sent in advance. Uh, they're, they're, they're so precious. And so I was able to get those and my aunt saved a little bit. Each one of our family members saved a little bit of something and I was able to piece it together just by research. And I, mm-hmm. I researched my family online and found out some amazing things about them that I never knew. Hmm. Um, and you have some photos. Can you share a few? Absolutely. Yes, let me share a few. Uh, so what, I, I don't know if you can see my screen, but um, this is this is the man who saved my family. This is a man named Jesse Boardman Hartwell Jr. He was a missionary uh, born in South Carolina, and he was called by God to preach the word of the Lord in China. He, he spent time in China, and this was during the Taiping Rebellion, one of many rebellions that China suffered through. And it, he had a church in China, and he was passing by the church, and he heard the cry of a young girl. And the young girl was discovered lying next to her dead mother, who had died during the uh, uh, during this rebellion. And uh, Jesse Boardman Hartwell took the young girl, rescued her, he adopted her, and he gave her the name Mary Hartwell. And Mary Hartwell is my great grandmother. Ah. And so if it not were for this man, he, we would not have had a family. Um, so that's one uh, 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 picture of, of our family. And the other one, um, uh, I'm not quite adept with, uh, working through my screen. So, um, but Mary Hartwell um, eventually married and she became, uh, she became, uh, she married a a man and they gave birth to three young boys and the boys were uh, working the Western businesses with Shell Oil and the Qingdao Railroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my, my, my grandfather grew up speaking English and uh, my grandfather raised uh, seven children. Uh, my grandfa- uh, grandfather uh, married um, uh, a woman who gave birth to uh, seven siblings, and one of the siblings was my mother. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, but I learned accidentally that my surname is Hartwell, and that I've tr- I've had, through this process of my research, I discovered I had a lost cousin uh, from Jesse Hartwell's line. So I found that there's a Hartwell cousin, uh, and Jesse Hartwell's writings and uh, books are in Yale Divinity School. So my next uh, objective is to go to Yale Divinity School and find out more about this man who, um, for some reason, decided he would want to rescue this young girl. Mm. So then um, your family, these people are in China, the Japanese invade. They are very brutal. Um, We won't go into that. Um, and so they uh, make their escape, right? So the three, like your grandfather and his brothers all escaped from China. Is that my, right? So the three, so my, my, my grandfather, his name is Frank. Um, he married a woman, Kate, and they had seven children, which, uh, one of which is my mother. Uh, in the book, I talk about that Frank um, had a concubine mm-hmm. and he left the family much to the dismay and embarrassment and anger of his children, my mother included. And when it came time, when the communists took over China and it closed the borders in 1940, uh, 1947, 48, 49, um, my grandfather, Frank, was with the concubine with whom he had a son. Mm-hmm. And when it came time for him to leave the country, he chose to stay in China with a concubine. And his last words to his wife, my grandmother, was, I'll see you in heaven. And years later, decades later, in in the 1960s, he changed his mind and wanted to come to be with his children in the United States. And because he had Western roots and a Western name, uh, he he was supposed to go to Hong Kong under an assumed name to escape communist China. Mm -hmm. And he was to have met someone who was going to meet him and take him to the United States. But the man who went to meet him went by the name that Frank was known as normally, did not know that Frank changed his name. And so missed the connection and Frank waited and the ship left without Frank and Frank went back and and my grandfather died in China alone, Mm. so. When did your father immigrate then? So my father, 
Uh, my father was born, we think he was born in 1915. There were no records then, but uh, China had got, China was going through numerous uh, rebellions and up, uprisings. And, you know, China only became a country in 1911. Right. And it was run by emperors before then. Uh, so in 1915, against the unstableness of, of, a, of a new country, his mother sent him to the United States. And in those days, a lot of people from Southern China, where my father was from, he was from Canton, now known as Guangzhou, a lot of Southern Chinese people went to Buffalo, New York, for some reason. And his brother had moved there before he did. So my father, the only way to get to, the only way to get, random. The only, yep. I'm the sorry. Only, it's interesting because you, you find out where they, they emigrated to. I think it was also, we had quotas in those days, the exclusion acts. Oh, right. So one had to be very careful to come into this country. Um, there was, in the quote, only allowed 105 Chinese to come into the country every year. Right? That's part of the, 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 the progressive laws that were designed to keep Chinese out mm -hmm. and to keep Chinese from coming back in. So it was not easy to come here. And the only way to come here in those days was by boat. So he, he went to Seattle. And what I didn't put in the book that, uh, because due to space, is we don't know whether Chin, my last name is C-H-I-N-N, -N, but we don't know if that's the real spelling of our name. Mm. My father added another N to the name because in Seattle, there are a lot of Chins with two Ns. And Chin is not a Chinese name. It's an Anglo-Saxon name. And my father said it was to throw off the, uh, the, the quota. If you, yeah. So it's interesting. So when my father came, he came into Seattle and the only way to get to Buffalo was by train. And in my book, I talk about that in those days, uh, the, the, there were black porters, right? The George Pullman had created the, the, the Pullman porters, mm -hmm. former slaves that he hired to uh, work on the luxury rail cars to serve the white customers. And so my father, uh, got on the rail car and the black porters uh, took a, a, a liking to him. He was just a teenage kid. He came here with a fifth grade education. And so my father's job was to hide on the train. But at the end of the night, he and the porters would take unused cigarettes that were unfiltered in those days. He'd unwrap the, the tobacco, rewrap them in fresh tobacco, and they'd smoke cigarettes. So through the kindness of the black porters mm. who harbored um, Chinese boys, uh, my father made it from uh, San Francisco, see Seattle, San mm -hmm. Francisco, and then all the way to Buffalo. Wow. By himself. <laughs> At 15. 15, 16. We, didn't know, we don't know his age. He was a yeah. or in there. Um, but he came with a fifth grade education and he settled in Buffalo where his brother had a restaurant and my father wanted to learn the restaurant business. And my father never wanted to work for anybody else. He wanted to be his own boss. And so when he, uh, he, he there was a small Chinatown in Buffalo in those days. Um, this is before the Chinese Expulsion Act that were, if you read history about the Chinese Expulsion Act, there were numerous cities that just burned and got rid of Chinatowns. Um, Eureka in, in, in California is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Truckee, uh, Los Angeles, there were many Chinatowns that were just burned and, and uh, decimated. So he went to um, New York and he went to NYU. He went to, he went to college, he, uh, he learned English. And then he was able to uh, go to NYU where he studied accounting. And uh, his, one of his professors was Robert McNamara who some of your viewers may know mm. uh, and under the Kennedy and Johnson administration. Right. And uh, he, he, he began to uh, decide he wanted, he, he loved chemistry. He was, a, he was the, the president of his chemistry class in high school. And I've always said that the best bartenders are chemists. He mm. became, became a, a red, he loved experiment in, in kitchens. And he just developed a love for, for feeding people. Mm -hmm. So how, wow. So how do you get from accounting to hospitality? That seems like, I mean, in my mind, those are sort of diametrically opposed because accountants are very, very um, focused and hospitality is very gregarious. Well, there's a so step, that's an interesting combination. There's a step in there that um, well, I was inspired to learn more about Goodyear Tire. 
because um, there was a there was a call to protest Goodyear Tire um, because the, uh, they they weren't allowed to do slogans or something. So, um, but Goodyear Tire had a program at one time where they had a program for to teach uh, Chinese boys the the work, the field of of a business of uh, inventory of how to run a business. Mm -hmm. And this was a very little known program that Goodyear Tire ran. And so my father was one of four Chinese boys who graduated from, from, uh, from NYU and, and, uh, and he, uh, he went to Harvard Business School. Wow. And so he, uh, so Goodyear recruited him to teach them about factory production, inventory uh, business. So my father just de de delighted in the appetite to learn more about what an what inventory looked like, how to, and then inventory came in handy when you were at a restaurant because all you have is inventory. Absolutely. But he, but he was always, but he was always a, someone who was gregarious. He just loved to watch people work. And uh, when he finally moved to New York and Chinatown, he would just watch how the kitchen operated. He was a great observer. Mm -hmm. which made him a great, a great businessman. So when he moved to Chinatown, was he then working in somebody's restaurant, like after he got his degree or was he still he, doing chemistry at that point? He, no, he, he was done with chemistry. He would, he went into, uh, he walked, he walked the streets of New York Chinatown to study the patterns of how, how restaurants are laid out. He mm -hmm. would study which restaurants had the most customers was it the entrance way that was inviting? What was it about the, the flow, the feng shui of a restaurant? He just studied this dynamic of it. Um, he was a most remarkable man in that he was unassuming, but he was just very curious about it. And then he decided he would someday run his own restaurant. Um, and that took him to Long Island, New York. And Long Island, for those of you who don't know, is just on the outskirts of Manhattan. It's about 45 miles outside of New York City. Uh, very, uh, very homogenized in those days. Yeah. And for him to go to Long Island, to bring our family to Long Island was a big move culturally because Long Island was, um, for those of you who don't know, the first suburb of the United States was uh, established on Long Island. It's called Levittown, created by a man named William Levitt. And Bill Levitt had a covenant that said, we will not but lease homes or sell homes to Negroes. And so there were, no, there were no people of color allowed in Levittown, which is eight miles from where I grew up. So this environment in which we grew up was, uh, was very uh, inhospitable to people of color. And we were still going through the residual impacts of, of keeping Chinese out. But my father persevered and, um, and Long Island in those days were all potato farms, potato fields. And they were known for Long Island potatoes were very famous in those days. Hmm. And uh, the first thing that somebody told him to do is if you want to fit into our community, you should join the Kiwanis Club. And my father met a whole bunch of people in the Kiwanis Club, including a banker who ran the Long Island National Bank. Mm. And he took a liking to my dad and uh, he said, there's an old potato barn. My father had a, 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 this potato barn in mind because it was right on the, the, the highway, mm -hmm. great location. And, uh, and the banker gave him the money uh, to buy the potato barn, which in those days, the way you did it was to shake hands. <laughs> there, was, there wasn't like a hundred page form to fill out this. Right. So you, you, got the, you got the loan, here's your money, here's your barn. <laughs> <laughs> here's your money, here's your barn. Here's your money, here's your barn. And then his first customers were the, the Kwanians who, and, and the banker who, who was very, very influential mm -hmm. uh, would send all of his bank customers to the restaurant. Mm. And that's how dad got started. And you, the, I'm sure your viewers might wonder, where'd you get all the cooks? Well, my father would drive into Chinatown, 45 miles uh, each, uh, 40 minutes, um, to pick up chefs every day. He'd have a station wagon, he'd drive in and pick up chefs in Chinatown, drive them to the restaurant, and then drive them back to Chinatown at the end of every shift. Wow. Yeah. So. When does your mother enter this picture? My mother entered the picture because she was, uh, she, whereas my father came to the United States uh, early on, my mother uh, was left behind in China. Uh, and all of her siblings had uh, emigrated to the United States. My mother is uh, the, uh, the, of the, th the three youngest siblings. My mother's the oldest of the three younger siblings. And so um, when my father, when my father was um, 
graduated uh, from NYU and, and Harvard, he decided he would become a citizen. And after the, he did that, he joined the Marines because he wanted to serve a country, uh, our country that was so good to him. Uh, so when he, and he was stationed in China and his he was in the intelligence and his job was uh, with the sixth um, uh, infantry was to go and uh, undo and find what the Japanese left behind in terms of uh, landmines and oh. the Japanese just torched everything. So my father's unit was sent to, uh, was stationed in Qingdao, China, where my mother was based. And my mother coming from a prominent family, such as Mary Hartwell and, and the, the, uh, my grandfather, uh, they, were, they were very well known. And so courtship happened and uh, my mother fell in love with my father. And uh, my father being the intelligence knew that Mao Zedong was sealing the borders. And he was able to get my mother and my sister who was born in China Mm -hmm. And my grandmother, my mother's mother, out on the last uh, military ship leaving China, the SS Adder. Wow. Before the border sealed. Wow. Yeah, because once that border sealed, it was sealed. It was sealed years. and you couldn't communicate, right? So there was no right. there was no internet in those days. There were no phones. The only way you could communicate with somebody inside China was through an intermediary. Mm -hmm. You had to do it by code. Uh, code words. Uh, it was not easy to stay in touch with people because uh, you could endanger the people in China if they were known to communicate with Westerners or people mm -hmm. in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the penalty was quite severe. So did he bring, okay, so he's in the Marine and in the Marines, he marries her and brings her back out. He completes his Marine service. Is he still in China doing his Marine service? No, he, he came, he came, he brought the, the, that family to San Francisco. Okay. And, uh, and then he, he left the Marines and then what did he do? He used his Goodyear tire connections from his, from the class and he ran a Goodyear tire dealership in San Francisco to earn money. Oh, interesting. This, I just, it's so fascinating, like the twists and the turns and it's, you know, it's like, oh, her family owns this restaurant. It's like, yeah, but that's such a small sliver. I mean, it's the, it's fun, but it's, it's fascinating, the twists and turns. So how did he get back? How did they all get back to New York? Well, one of the, so the pandemic of the time was tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, my mother, uh, my mother, um, uh, and my sister, and uh, my father come to the United States in San Francisco. They settled here, and they had a son. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, the son, my mother contracted tuberculosis and inadvertently passed tuberculosis on to my brother, who died at the age of just over a year old. Mm -hmm. And so um, this tragedy happened, and when my mother. Uh, was had to recuperate in a place called Redwood City, where they had a sanatorium, one of many sanatoriums in the country that treated uh, people with tuberculosis. And the treatment in those days, because there was no cure in those mm -hmm. days, uh, was to remove the lung. So wow. my mother's left lung was removed. And uh, uh, I mean, it was, it was so draconian. Uh, and so she had to recover in Redwood City in isolation. So while she was there, my father uh, couldn't take care of, of my sister alone, who was a young, young toddler. Mm -hmm. So he took my sister to New York, where a major part of my family base had settled. My mother's older sister settled uh, in New York uh, because they were involved with nursing at, at Columbia University. And, uh, and so the gravitational pull was in New York. My mother was left behind. And eventually my mother reunited with my father when she recuperated. How long did it take to recuperate? Oh, she never really did. And so, you know, when you think about tuberculosis and we had a restaurant before right. the days of non-smoking, by the way. Right. So, um, so, so has the, one lung and, one lung. oh, wow. One but lung how, long, and, how long was she separated from the family? She probably separated about three years or so because my- wow. Yeah, and my so my father and my sister uh, were to, were in, in New York together, and my father eventually you know made the, uh, she eventually made, made the way, her way over, and she got a job in a in a in a in a sewing factory. My mother loved to sew, and um, so the the rehabilitation of my mother uh, began when they reunited back in the back of the East Coast, um, but the 
the, the impact of tuberculosis, uh, of course, um, uh, was in a talk in my book that my mother eventually, my mother never smoked at all in her life. Right. And my mother eventually at the age of 76 succumbed to lung cancer. Um, and I think that's due to the, the weaknesses and also the abject starvation that she and her sisters went through. They had eight years of eating nothing um, that compounded the, the, the health problems in the family. And still she made it to 76. She made it and... to 76. She, 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 was a, she, was a, she was a hard horse, yeah. Yes, yeah. So he's in New York and um, he uses his connections to buy this restaurant, buy this barn and turn it into a restaurant. And um, there were not very many Chinese restaurants outside of Chinatown at that time. We're talking, what is right. this, like early 60s, right? 1960, yeah. Yeah. yeah and don't forget that in, in, in those days, probably Chinese food was maybe chunking or right. le choy. You, know, you had the canned foods in those days. And there was no sushi in those days. Right. Uh, There's no uh, Sichuan food. Uh, you know that the the food is Cantonese. That was was considered like comfort food. Right. So, um, we my father had a, had the restaurant that because it was mostly white clientele, um, he, he they called it continental restaurants in those days. They had steaks mm -hmm. and lobsters, and then he would expect he had a whole bunch of Chinese food on the side that was um, what he called the house specials. And as a chemist, he would uh, hang out in the kitchen with the chefs, and they would do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and you know they bring stuff from Chinatown and. And, uh, what, and they try it on a customer and the customer liked it, it became the house special. So, mm -hmm. and there were no recipes, you know, chemist, he didn't really measure anything. Right. What was, uh, what I think people remember about the food and why it was so different um, is that we don't, we source foods differently now. You mm. know, the, the environment has changed. The oceans have changed, you know, food tastes differently now. But in, in those days, everything was fresh. The noodles were fresh. Um, so, you know, when you, when you had wontons, they were all fresh. They weren't packaged. They weren't frozen. Shrimp was fresh. Everything was fresh in those days. So um, nothing was canned or processed. It was just uh, what we would call, you know, uh, organic food now, but, uh, but there was no name for it back then. Right. So, um, There's, so he's going on with this Chinese restaurant and it's getting more and more popular. Yep. It's getting and, more popular because the food is so good. And also the, one of the highlights, which ties into how I developed my career as a CEO or an art executive is there was a passion for radical hospitality that it was, we were cheers before cheers ever came into, into, into being. And everybody felt that they were there. They were there for the first time. You were there like you, you were like a family member. And uh, the way customers are treated were like you just came home. And so th there was that approach to a restaurant tour that really wasn't around very, very much. You, you went to fine dining uh, to other restaurants. You, you maybe visited by a waiter once or twice. Mm. But we, my brother and I, would sit with the with the with the with the customers. We'd like eat with them. We'd like you know chat with them and. It was just a different kind of experience that um, I think people remember fondly. And so it expands and there's a gift shop and your mother is running the front of the house and um, things are going really well. And then Flower Drum Song comes out and Hawaii gets statehood and all of these things sort of combine and the Polynesian tiki experience that's right it's showing up so that's right. your dad was like oh hey let's cash in on this well my father loved to try new things and you know before before that he had a fascination with baked potatoes i don't know why but he just thought i'm going to start something called greater taters and i'm going to just think about different ways now it's very common but in those days he, he was fascinated by a baked potato and so um that never didn't take off but he always had something in mind but when the Hawaiian, uh, Hawaii became a state in 1959, and there was the spurt of Missioners Hawaii, there was Flower Drum Song uh, mm -hmm. on Broadway, directed by Gene Kelly, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was Valley High, and there was um, uh, Disneyland. 
created the Tiki Room mm -hmm. and uh, the Alamo Moana Shopping Center in, uh, in Waikiki, uh, Hawaii, had the largest outdoor shopping center in the world at that time. And they were gonna add a huge Polynesian entertainment center. So this whole thing about Hawaii was, was rocking the country back then. There's a curiosity about it. And in New York, going to Hawaii was was almost impossible. There weren't trips, there were you, airlines didn't fly there with regularity. It was a very mysterious mm -hmm. uh, part of the world. It, it, it had only recently be, uh, moved from a territory to a state. Okay. And so, there, so we decided that we would go and, and see what this craze was all about. And we uh, had a family vacation and went to Hawaii and we fell in love with that culture. Mm -hmm. And dad, walked around and looked at the different Polynesian nightclubs. And he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand the restaurant. I'm gonna add a nightclub to it. Uh, and that's what he did. And so the Potato Barn became a, a Polynesian nightclub. We kept the, the original dining room. And the, for those watching my screen, that this was, this was the later version of the dining room uh, after my dad did the renovation. Uh, it went through numerous re re renovations. Uh, but the dining room remained the same. And then on the other side of the building became the Polynesian nightclub that sat another 150 people and uh, two more bars and a cocktail lounge. It became this huge thing where about 600 people could be uh, accommodated every night. Wow. And 600 people did. We said it was just packed to the gills. Can you show us some pictures? You bet. Let me see if I can drive this car a little bit here. Let's see. Let's see if I can find these for you. So this is, um, I think you all know, this is the famous Trader Vic's, uh, which is in New York. We also have one here. Uh, this is what the inside of a of a, of a, of a, a nightclub looks like. This is this is. Uh, look at the. I, I look at this because I want the viewers to know that my father was so enamored by by uh, this decor that. He renovated our house, so we had an extension in our house, and the house started looking like this. Hmm. This is the uh, Disneyland, the Enchanted Tiki Room ex ex extension, and uh, this is the facade of what used to be the barn. And uh, the facade was made by by a stone, and each stone was inlaid by hand. There were no machines by laborers who chiseled every rock and stone and then crafted them into what uh, look like their porches in the front. And then this is the, uh, let's slow it up here, let me see if I can. But this is, uh, this, that's me in the front. Um, and this was the, the, the nightclub. And uh, this is the uh, a sword that I danced with. And this, every floor show has a fire dancer. And this was our fire dancer. He was a real Samoan chief, by the way. And yes, that's right. He has fire on the soles of his feet. And that is a typical uh, uh, climax of uh, what a fire dancer did. And that is me dancing with a knife. Um, and that's a very old me. I would say. Or a very young you. <laughs> Perhaps. This, this is the original troupe. Um, and uh, the man playing the guitar uh, was a real uh, prince. He, his name was Prince Poki. Uh, and these were the original uh, uh, troupe members. The two women in the front were in the uh, Broadway production of Flower Drum Song, directed by Gene Kelly. And the two women in front helped Gene Kelly find dancers for that production because they knew where all the Hawaiian dances were. Um, so that's just a little snippet of what uh, Polynesia on Long Island looked like. So, and for you growing up, you know, we've said you started selling cigarettes at three. Um, and, you know, at that time, cigarettes were often bought singly. Um, so it's not like, you know, you were just handing out packages. You were actually like parsing out a single cigarette. Right. We didn't have a, there wasn't a vending machine in those days. So my right. mother would have cartons of cigarettes and my job was to take them out of the, the packets and I'd line them up in a counter mm -hmm. and I would line them up by color because I was just so color coordinated at the age of three. <laughs> and we sold cigars there. And my job was to sell cigarettes, 45 cents a pack. 
mm-hmm. and uh, had a little change box and the customers would give me a dollar and I would learn how to give change. And, um, and my job was to just sell as many cigarettes as I could. And, and how could you say no to a three-year-old girl right. selling cigarettes, really? <laughs> and oh. my mother said, so my mother got worried because I was inhaling the tobacco because I love the smell of tobacco. I just really loved going, putting my head in there. And I was small enough I could fit in there. And I would just lie in there and smell the tobacco and the cigars. Very worrisome to my mother. And so she said, um, go help the bartender. Uh, sit at the bar and put toothpicks and cherries and pineapples. So you put. Them. So I hung out at the bar at the age of six. And customers would come and talk to me. And I talked to them. And my, they would. there was a crowd that would gather at the bar. And my mother and father said, don't leave because you're good for business. So right. I learned how to be a bartender yep, at an early age. So then as you get older, you got more attracted to the stage, right? Well, then my, I think my mother and father thought that we were novelty acts. So I was put into the show at the age of 12 and 13. And I, I had no business doing that, but I just fell in love with um, the, the whole ensemble-ness of dancing, of, of learning this culture. And it was, um, there was, it was hard because it was uh, uh, late hours. These were shows that were, that were very concentrated in the uh, 90 minutes that we did. Um, and then there were two shows on, uh, on, on there were shows on, on Wednesday, a show on Friday night, but on Saturday night, there were two shows, nine o'clock and then midnight, mm-hmm. if you can believe it. Uh, people just packed the show at midnight in those days. Yeah. <laughs> Back when we were all younger. Um, they, you were doing the sword dance, right? As well, right. like playing with the not playing with a sword, but I mean, that's dangerous. It's very dangerous. How long did it take you to learn how to do it before you got on stage? Like, how long did that take and who taught you? Well, the the Samoan prince, chief taught me how to do that. Um, But I, uh, there's an excerpt in the book where I talk about how I learned how to do it. And Mm -hmm. we practiced on the redwood deck of my, of our house because the parking lot at the restaurant was so crowded. And, uh, and I had to build up my muscles and I learned how to do figure eights and, and we practiced till I could do the knife dance. And then it came time to do it on stage. And I, I re- realized I practiced with my eyeglasses on, but during the performance, we couldn't, nobody wore glasses. I had 2200 vision. So I always dropped the knife, oh, <laughs> then, uh, but people loved it because I was a young teenage girl and no girl did a knife dance in those days. Right, uh, and then my uh, because I, I was such a popular number, uh, the thought was to do a fire dance, mm. and so I was um, asked to do a fire dance, um, which was just terrifying. So I was just put out there because I was, you know, good for business. <laughs> I guess they like to say. Right, and um, in the book you talk about how the fire dance didn't actually pan out. Or it didn't pan out. Do Do we have time to read a little sec- section of it? Yeah, I, yeah, I would love that. Okay, so uh, Toby, who's the chief, he uh, he envisioned a fire pit prelude to his fire number. You saw the picture of him with the fire on his feet. Uh, so this involved me dancing around the stage to the sound of drums before slowly stepping onto a pit of fire. And to prepare, I had to build calluses on my feet, which meant walking barefoot outside as much as possible, especially on pebbles or any hard, uneven surface. And I practiced on the hot asphalt of our driveway on a sidewalk, and after a while, Toofy said I was ready. So back to our redwood deck we went. He placed a large industrial walk on a two foot tall metal stand. And I practiced by stepping up onto the walk, getting my balance, doing some hand motions, and then stepping down slowly one foot at a time. And after I got used to that, it was time for the fire. He soaked rags with benzene in the walk and lit them. Fire wasn't that high, just up to my calves. The same calves that got caught on the hook of my knife. Toopi said to step up onto the fire with one foot, step on with the other, stay two seconds, then step off with one foot, and then the other. Now he demonstrated with feet thickened by years of fire dancing. Right. And do you know how hot fire is on the soles of your feet? <laughs> it's painfully hot, no matter how thick your calluses are. Right. I managed to step up 
but left off before even getting the other foot onto the benzene soak rag. Yeah. So if he had the garden hose ready to spray on the soles of my feet to cool them off, then we try again. I got a little better at it and could stand on the fire for two seconds, then three more seconds without yelling out in pain. Okay. After much rehearsal and now a nicked, dented and charred redwood deck, I told her, okay, I couldn't bring myself to do this number. I didn't want to grow up with deformed feet. And I told Ovi no one would take me to the prom if I was disfigured. And my dramatic pleading convinced Ovi that I, and I never performed the fire dance at Mahjong. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, many thanks to you for a very informative conversation. Um, this is a fascinating book and there's so much that we could have covered that they didn't. Yeah. The only, if anyone has a question, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, there, somebody asked about the picture behind you, which is indeed um, the reimagined Mahjong um, after the Polynesian, right? The Polynesian right. redo. This is in the later years. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, th uh, that arched or the round door is just so fabulous. And that's on the cover of the book. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So Karen asks, um, did your parents push you to dance or were you the driver of your performances? You know, I think my parents uh, didn't really push me. They encouraged me and I just fell into it. Now my brother, on the other hand, who's mm -hmm. two years younger, uh, just didn't want to be pushed. He didn't, he just didn't stay very long. But I just remember how colorful it was. And, and I just felt that this was what I wanted to do for a living. I wanted to be in the arts. I wanted to be an actress, a dancer, something. Mm -hmm. But in my 13-year-old imagination, I thought, this is the world I want to be in. Um, Kelly asks, oh, no, I'm sorry. This is Donna. Um, how long was your family in Buffalo? Um, she says, I wasn't aware that there was a Chinatown there. Yep. And um, do you know the approximate location? Evidently, Donna knows something about Buffalo. <laughs> yes, yes. In fact, uh, there, um, the, I wrote, I researched it. It's it's on what was Main Street, everything on Main Street. And there was actually was a Chin's Chinese restaurant. It's no longer there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, he was there probably about four or five years, and then he he left to go to, uh, to NYU. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you make tips? Oh, so... Um, you know, one of the book talks about, uh, yeah, yeah, I made a lot of tips, but the book also talked about for Chinese New Year, um, we, uh, my, my dad loved to gamble. Um, this was a big bone of contention in my family. He loved to gamble. And after Chinese New Year, when we had, we closed the restaurant down so that uh, the proceeds could go to the Chinese Cultural Center of Long Island. My mother remembering what it was like to have artifacts destroyed in China. So it was very important for my parents to uh, support organizations that uh, was about cultural heritage. But the restaurant was a huge, and I have pictures in the book about what it looked like. But after all the customers left, my father turned the entire room into a gambling den and all the waiters came out and all the cooks came out. And so I would, I, I hung around tables where I would watch the waiters playing uh, poker or dominoes. And every time I sat next to, a, so, stood next to a, someone who got a winning hand, they'd give me a little money. And I learned how to read body language of who was doing who was doing well with the cards. So I made a lot of money uh, yeah. just looking cute. So. <laughs> well, not just looking cute. You were <laughs> practicing for poker hands without having to go. actually be involved. It's like yeah. reading the cues and stuff. Um, Kelly asks, um, she says, thank you for coming. Is there a new play in the works for your book? Hmm. And um, I can see Francis Jew in your father's pictures. Oh, really? That's that's such an honor. I love Francis Chu. Uh, my goal is to, yes, is, is to do next an, to an audio book of this, but I am really interested in, in finding someone who can treat this into a screenplay or do mm -hmm. something with it. I've been told that there's, there's, a, there's a lot of there there. Uh, so my next endeavor will be to try to find an agent, try to find someone who can make this into a series or something of some kind. Um, but uh, there, there, it's an unfinished memoir, so there's still more to be uh, revealed. And there are about 200 pages that couldn't fit to the book mm. um, due to space. So there's, right. there's still some, some, they're still to write. So William asks, have you been back to China, your place of birth and your impressions? Well, actually, you weren't born in China, but your family. 
I was. I, I was very honored to have been asked by the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, I was consulting with them uh, to do the China, China residency program. And the Philadelphia Orchestra and China have a very uh, distinguished and special relationship. Because when um, when uh, Nixon when Mao opened the board Nixon went to China, mm-hmm. um, they began to thaw the relationships and uh, 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 Mao Tse uh, Mao Tse Tung uh, uh, wanted to know about more Western influences. But the first orchestra invited to go to China after the uh, the, the borders were sealed was the Philadelphia Orchestra, mm-hmm. and so um, Eugene Ormandy, for those of you who don't know, was the maestro, and uh, they did Beethoven, Beethoven's Pastoral the Sixth, right. and uh, so the and so I was asked to go to China to commemorate the, the anniversary of the of that historic visit, and I uh, I got to travel. I got to talk to people who were there who were teenagers. And they remember what it was like because the only music in China during the communist revolution were the nationalistic songs, marches. Um, and so when they heard the lush orchestral strings of the of these Philadelphia orchestra, uh, they it, people told me they gave them hope that they could survive this, this regime. So I got to go to my, uh, my father's hometown of Guangzhou which looks nothing like it anymore. Uh, I was in Beijing and everything is, is like LA, it's all built up now. Mm. Uh, but I distinctly remember the goosebump feeling of uh, being on, this, uh, on, on the land and doing cultural diplomacy for the Philadelphia Orchestra, mm. which was uh, part of the, uh, the, my heritage of what my, my ancestors did. Yeah. David asks, um, can you talk um, about moving into your later career in arts administration and how did your early experiences as a uh, sword dancer uh, prepare <laughs> you for that? <laughs> I think I should carry the sword when I go to my budget meetings is what I'm thinking. I think but, so. But uh, I wanted to be a classical pianist and I'm, I'm, I'm very klutzy. So when it came time to do my auditions, I, uh, I, I had to pick another major and I picked theater. And I applied to colleges and I got into University of Southern California. And my artistic director there was John Hausman, the legendary John Hausman. Uh, And it was a very rigorous uh, experience. But after college, I was trying to find my way into uh, work. I was kind of off my parents' payroll. And I had no, uh, I didn't have any work clothes. So I went into a department store and I got a job uh, in the department store selling coats in Southern California. Um, and then I had no experiences working in a bank. So I, got, I worked in a bank, an insurance place, anything to get some experience in, 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 the, in the business world. Uh, but I also uh, volunteered for any theater company that would have me at night. So I worked nine to five during the day and I do uh, volunteer work from six to midnight and I'd hang lights, I'd build sets, I'd pour coffee, I'd do whatever. And my eventual uh, uh, college uh, major in stage management. And I began to move into producing on a volunteer basis for small theater companies and eventually got to make connections. And one of those connections uh, was a a man who ran and started the Young Conservatory at American Conservatory Theater, Craig Slate, uh, who held that job for 30 years until he retired recently. And he told me there's a job with your name on it, ACT. It's it's the development department. And I said, what is that? He said, relationship building, parties. And so I flew up to San Francisco and I interviewed, I got the job on the spot. And that began my first job in the arts as a nonprofit professional, as a special events director and volunteer management. And over the course of my career, I just moved into the world of development, fundraising, producing, and all of the jobs I had, the insurance job, the banking job, selling codes that all amalgamated into what I had to learn on the business side. And uh, I eventually moved into becoming an executive director uh, and I uh, and running uh, arts organizations where I have always reflected on the radical hospitality ethos mm-hmm. of my family. So every a theater that I run, every arts organization I run, I want the patrons and everybody to feel that when they come to the theater uh, or, a, or, or a concert, that you have an experience like you had at Mahjong, which is you're greeted warmly. And, you know, so, and that's something that I've, I've really emulated. And I think it's missing in a lot of business today. Mm. 
especially coming out of the pandemic when it's all self-serve and you have to scan, you can't even talk to a waiter, you got to scan something, right. but we've, we've, we've lost the human touch. Yeah. And for me, the restaurant was high touch, a uh, high relationship, high warmth, empathy mm-hmm. that I bring into my, my life as a CEO of an arts, of arts organization. Well, we're running out of time. So thank you so very much. This is fascinating. There is a link in the chat to buy her book directly from Books Inc. Um, And I hope this talk has intrigued you and made you want to read more. Um, So in closing, um, we, oh, I just said that, Never mind. Um, And Thank you again for your time and for sharing your fascinating life. This has been a lot of fun. I really well, thank, enjoyed it. Thank you for running a library. Thank you for supporting a library. <laughs> I think it's so important that we have libraries and reading and stories, um, especially today. Yeah. And so I thank everybody who's been here uh, and, and the work that you're all doing at Alameda, the library, such important work these days. So thank yeah. you all very much. We're getting some thank yous in the chat. So you might want to head over there and take a look at people who are, okay. who can talk happy. to you directly. Okay. In the meantime, I'd like a reminder to consider a donation to the Friends of the Alameda Free Library at alamedafriends.com or through the link that is posted in the chat. This will help us continue to produce events like this one. Also, if you have a friend who has missed this talk, you can tell them that it will be available on YouTube in the next few days. They can check the alamedafriends.com website for a link to this talk and all of the talks that we have been doing for the past few years. Our next Friends at Home event will be Susan Strait talking about her novel Mecca, which is a stunning epic tracing the intertwined lives of native Californians fighting for life and land. It's brand new, having just been published on March 14th, And um, we will be speaking with her on April 5th. I would like to thank the team that makes these events happen. David Beal, Karen Manuel, Karen Romer, Renisha Robinson, Kumar Font, Karen Butler, or Butter, sorry, Kathleen Adcock, Billy Reisenschmidt, and Becky Sear. And a special thanks again to Debbie Chin for an informative and entertaining program. Finally, Thanks to all of you for joining us this evening.